Okay, um, let's, let's begin. Uh, it looks like some of our class may have taken an early uh, uh, midterm break uh, in anticipation of, of, of next week. Um, but today's uh, topic is uh, inequality. Um, it's of course a, an issue that we've been talking um, on and around um, since the, the beginning of, of the course. Um, uh, in, in these introductory um, uh, comments, I just want to make a three broad set of points. One, uh, in relation to the changing role and emphasis that is placed on inequality in our policy discussions today. Um, secondly, um, I want to say something about um, the, uh, the, the, the evidence, uh, the empirical evidence on um, uh, inequality around the world because it, it, it points to some important um, facts about policies and institutional arrangements and how they differ. Um, and, and third, I want to um, say a little bit about this, um, this taxonomy that's up on the screen, uh, which is a way of uh, organizing our thinking uh, about how to address um, uh, different types of inequality um, and uh, through different types of instruments, and that might be a way for us to, uh, to take the discussion forward. Um, first, uh, on the role of, of inequality in our current discussions, um, uh, it's not that long ago that um, in uh, much of the discussion about economic policy and inequality, there was a kind of a stark separation. Uh, both in the way that economists thought about inequality and the way that that discussion was reflected uh, in, in policy and among technocrats and, and much of the political discourse as well, uh, which was that um, a, this separation between what you needed to do um, to uh, achieve economic growth, um, grow the size of the pie, uh, innovate, be more productive, be more competitive, one set of policies, uh, growth, call these growth and development or productivity policies, if you will, depending on if you're an advanced country, emerging mark uh, economy or, a, or developing countries. And then uh, policies uh, that were directly targeting um, inequality uh, or, or, or poverty, um, that is uh, broadly sort of social policies, poverty reduction policies. Uh, but that those were different, that there was a division of labor largely uh, in government agencies, among government works, and in the type of work that also economists did. Now, the, the intellectual um, foundation for that division uh, between growth, development, productivity on the one hand, um, and inequality and poverty on the other, was that effectively that you could intellectually disentangle these two things with two sets of policies that were directly targeting those goals. So that um, economists think about sort of e efficiency enhancing policies that will enlarge the size of the pie and then redistributive policies, policies that will compensate the losers or will take care of poverty or those at the very bottom. And that the most effective ways that you can actually I advance economic policy in this broad and inclusive way uh, is to keep a, a, a kind of a um, somewhat um, neat separation between two these uh, two kinds of policies. So for example, in the context of uh, trade policy and globalization, uh, that our trade policies with regard to um, tariffs, uh, non-tariff barriers, our rules um, and our negotiations uh, in the WTO or with respect to regional or bilateral trade arrangements need not directly um, uh, concern themselves with issues of inequality, um, uh, um, either across the labor market, across labor or capital or, or regionally, um, that those should really focus on enhancing the efficiency of the functioning of the world economy, lower and reduce transactions costs to um, uh, international commerce and, uh, and investment. Um, and if those efficiency enhancing and hopefully growth enhancing arrangements in the area of trade uh, were to produce uh, consequences that were undesirable from the standpoint of inequality um, and uh, perhaps people at the bottom of the income distribution, 
that there ought to be other mechanisms that really didn't involve trade policy per se to deal with those. Those would be social policies, unemployment insurance, um, aid to families, um, uh, you know, trade adjustment assistance in the case of the United States that you, know, you can do separately from your, from your trade policies. Um, but, that, but that any suggestion that a country's trade policies ought to be uh, concerned directly with inequality would be viewed as, as, as undesirable or at, at the very least odd um, because of this sort of division of labor, both intellectually and in the way that uh, technocrats and policymakers thought about how they would do this work. Um, another area uh, would be, uh, um, for example, with respect to central banking monetary policy, interest rate policies of the central bank. The idea was that uh, the monetary policy should largely target the narrow goal of inflation control um, and, um, and where there is a kind of a dual mandate, also overall level of employment. But that monetary policy or interest rate policy should not be directly concerned with issues of inequality uh, because after all there are sort of other policies um, that uh, uh, should target those. Um, I think both in the area of trade um, very clearly and in the area of central banking and monetary policy somewhat less clearly but still uh, so, I think this, this division is now become, is, is, is being questioned for reasons um, that, that I will outline in a second. But particularly germane to our discussion here on, on uh, the, uh, the knowledge economy and new technologies, there is one area of discussion where in fact uh, there is still to some extent this distinction that exists as a carryover and that's with regard to our thinking about technology and innovation and, um, and there too much of the discussion on technology and innovation really doesn't take on board inequality directly uh, when you think about what kind of uh, innovation, what kind of technologies to support, uh, firms' policies. Again, the implicit assumption being that any incidental effects on labor markets or inequality would be taken care of uh, through other policies, whether it is investments in education, training, social safety nets, unemployment insurance, and, and so forth. And that's something that we've questioned here, and I'll come back to that and probably disc presumably discuss this more at length. I think the reason that um, this, this um, uh, division, this stark division, both intellectual and in terms of policymakers' division of labor uh, between efficiency and equity um, uh, has um, increasingly uh, uh, um, uh, you know, dissipated has to do with, with a number of, of features one is, you know, just, you know, the, um, you know, just the hard reality um, that simply because if you assume that there'll be somebody else to compensate the losers doesn't necessarily mean that eventually the co losers will be compensated. Um, so uh, just this, you know, blithe um, assumption that you don't need to consider uh, uh, issues of inequality when you're dealing with the bulk of economic policy pol uh, problems because there will be something, somebody else or some other agency, some other alternative set of policies that will kick in. You know, when it's clear that that doesn't happen, um, then uh, this fundamental justification for this, this separation uh, falls by the wayside. And I would say certainly in the case of trade, this was one of the key um, uh, things that has moved the you know, mainstream view on this because it did look like you know, all the safety nets and the compensations that were supposed to take place did not take place. And, and we might talk a little bit more about that when we talk about globalization uh, at a later session. Um, so one reason why um, I think this, this distinction has fallen by the wayside is just the realization that even, in th even if in theory it's possible to disentangle efficiency from considerations of equity that in, in the practical world of policy in the real world that, that uh, it may not be because uh, you know, the, the complementary measures that you need to ensure uh, equity is taken care of uh, may not be put in place for a variety of reasons. 
Uh, the second broader set of uh, the reason for why the distinction is as lost, sort of, um, you know, economists and policymakers have lost faith in this distinction, is is broader and and deeper, um, and it doesn't have to do necessarily with the sort of the practical world of policy, but it's much more fundamentally um, uh, with the nature of our economy and how matters of equity and efficiency might in fact be intermingled uh, so that you cannot disentangle those. Um, so that you see the reflection of this, for example, in the reading by um, Sandy Black and, and, um, and her co-author uh, in, in the reading for this week, which talks about sort of how people are doing uh, in labor markets or in terms of social insurance as fundamentally as market failures. Uh, so you start thinking about um, issues of uh, exclusion from education or for social insurance for you know efficiency reasons uh, so that um, treating some of the fundamental causes of inequality whether it's accessing labor markets accessing uh, insurance markets uh, being able to send your kids to school accessing health um, you know those become not simply matters of uh, you know transferring incomes but they reflect fundamental um, inadequacies in the way that markets work and that, that this issue of, of inefficiency and equity gets in, entangled so that dealing with these problems, dealing with fundamental problems of equity is not simply a matter of uh, compensating people. Uh, it's actually a matter of ensuring that the economy lives to its full potential. In other words, part of the efficiency agenda. If otherwise, you know, capable and smart people can't go to school, uh, if they cannot live up to their full human potential uh, because of access to uh, um, uh, medical insurance or, or health insurance, uh, that's an economic failure as well as a failure uh, to treat um, uh, underlying sources of, of, um, of, of, of inequ inequity. Um, the same point is made um, uh, on a broader um, canvas in the article uh, of mine with, with um, uh, with um, uh, Chuck, Chuck Sable, where we talk about uh, the decline in good jobs or um, the scarcity of good jobs is a fundamental uh, source of negative externalities. Um, and this negative externality reveals itself in a number of ways. It reveals itself as local social and political failures um, so that the fundamentals of society, the fundamentals of a political system, which has actually required for a private enterprise system to thrive and for there to be adequate trust in a private enterprise system is undermined when good jobs disappear, um, uh, families break down, there is increasing uh, addiction, crime rates go up, uh, these various social ills um, uh, are then magnified through um, political uh, trends of uh, you know, increase in authoritarian values, increase in, in othering groups that are seen as outsiders, where are, whether they are people of a different religion or people of a different ethnic group or immigrants, um, and ultimately support right-wing authoritarianism as a way of, of essentially uh, stigmatizing and blaming others as the supposed source of, of some of these economic and, and, and social um, uh, problems. So these social and political failures that a accompany um, uh, joblessness um, and, uh, and, and, and declining opportunities for middle class or, or good and decent jobs um, are, can be viewed as undermining, um, because of the social and political externalities, undermining the kinds of, of um, fundamentals of a, 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 a kind of um, trust and faith and, 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 um, and capable functioning of a private enterprise or a market market system. So it's not simply a matter of compensating people. It's a matter of, of essentially ensuring that the fundamental institutional underpinnings, the social and trust underpinnings of a market society are in place. Once again, uh, it no longer makes sense to disentangle um, uh, these uh, the questions of efficiency from questions of, of, um, uh, of, of equity. And then much more directly in the economic sphere, but also something that very cl closely links now these two aspects and makes them um, uh, inextricably uh, connected, is that 
in environments where the benefits of innovation, new technologies are not disseminated throughout society and through um, parts of the country that are lagging behind, you are ultimately undermining even the economic performance of a society because these new technologies, uh, these vanguard sectors, as Roberto calls them, remain relatively small, remain relatively cloistered from the rest. And one of the puzzles of our current pre predicament is how innovation and new technologies and the knowledge economy you know, dazzles us by everything that is happening. Yet when you look at economy-wide productivity, the performance is actually not that striking. And the reason, of course, is this divide uh, between where this new technology is being put in place and, and the large parts of the country and large parts of the labor force, which are effectively not taking part in this process. This pro productive polarization is also undermining economy-wide productivity growth, economy-wide growth, uh, because anything that reduces the ability of these, uh, the knowledge economy and these new technologies to disseminate throughout the labor force, it's not just an equity problem, it's also an economic problem because it, it reduces overall pot the possibilities of overall productivity. Um, so for uh, all these reasons, um, I think um, th you know the this separation is 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 no longer um, uh, a key part of thinking, and this is one way to understand how e inequality has um, come to the forefront of the policy discussions, not just simply as a kind of a uh, on the part of economists at least, not just sort of a. a, a, a a delayed or a belated recognition that oh, we need to talk about inequality. Uh, it's also much more fundamentally uh, because of, of our you know, changes in the way that we're understanding how the economy works and efficiency and equity might be actually intermingled uh, that you can't really um, uh, separate them in a way that you know, the Ministry of Finance uh, deals with efficiency and the Ministry of Education uh, um, uh, or health deals with issues of e equity. Um, now, the second uh, point, uh, which I'll, I'll go over rather quickly, is about the evidence. We talk about rising inequality uh, around the world, um, but uh, the performance really has been highly, highly uneven, um, where inequality has probably risen the, fast among the fastest among the advanced countries is in the United States. Uh, whether you look at indicators like the Gini coefficient or wage dispersion indicators, or you look at the rise in the share of the top 1% or the top 1,000th uh, percent income concentration at the top, that's very striking. But if you look at a country like uh, France in Europe, uh, you actually don't see um, a, a similar increase uh, in inequality uh, in the labor market or inequality rising, uh, um, I increase in the Gini coefficient. Um, the, the, the increase in top incomes, uh, which is very startling in the United States, has taken place in Europe, but not quite to the same extent. Um, so there is, there is huge variation across countries, which suggests that policies and institutional arrange arrangements make a lot of difference. Um, and I think a large part of it is, as, as um, uh, Roberto has stressed before, um, at least once, is in the, is in the, in the size of the state, um, the overall expenditure of the state um, and um, the tax take uh, makes a big difference. Uh, not because of the progressivity of the tax regime per se, because the income tax regime in the United States is also fairly progressive, um, uh, uh, but uh, that a larger tax take uh, enables uh, much larger investments um, in, in, in education, in health, uh, in, in social insurance, um, in, in families, um, and then can sort of bring up the, the, the bottom up and, and keep the bo you know, sort of the bottom from, from dropping. Um, nevertheless, so even though um, the actual um, evidence on patterns of inequality shows significant heterogeneity across countries, um, that there is still 
a, a kind of um, very similar set of concerns that are expressed across societies with respect to um, social mobility, with respect to um, rising gaps in access to public services, um, rising, rising spatial segregation, the rich and the poor um, separating themselves out, um, rising levels of economic insecurity. So that the complaints you, had you hear from people in France about labor market prospects, um, uh, about their um, expectations about the future, about whether they think they live in a fair society, are actually not that different today than what you hear from people in the United States, although in terms of these course indicators of inequality, um, uh, the, per the, the, the performance has been uh, quite different between the United States and France. So that suggests that you know, beneath those broad uh, statistics, uh, there is some common thing that is happening. And what that common thing that is happening, I would suggest, are uh, these tensions and insecurities associated with labor market development, uh, that a combination of globalization and technological change um, has, disrupted technolog has disrupted the traditional organizations uh, in the labor market and has blocked for many paths to secure middle uh, class kinds of, 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 of lives. And that shows up uh, in, um, in uh, complaints about economic insecurity, about unfairness, and, and paths to social mobility in the middle class being, being blocked. So that means that when we talk about inequality, we have to be very careful about whether we're talking about what's happening in the labor markets, what's happening at top income levels, are we talking about the very bottom, the poorest, what's happening to them? And uh, that brings me uh, to uh, the, f the final uh, point that I wanted to make with the help of this um, uh, taxonomy, which helps us organize our thinking about precisely uh, what type of inequality we're talking about and what kinds of, of uh, possible range of interventions we might be, um, we might be um, uh, contemplating. So I think if you look at the, uh, the rows, the rows um, are about sort of when I say to you inequality, what is it that you're really concerned about? Are you really concerned about people at the very bottom? You're concerned about inequality because you're worried about what's happening uh, in the bottom quarter or maybe the bottom decile of the population. Um, so that's um, the bottom. You might be concerned when I talk to you about inequality about people at the very top, what's happened to the richest, uh, the wealthiest, and that would be sort of the, the, third, call, the third row. Or you might, be hap you might be worried about what's happening to the middle class, um, whether it's you know, sort of this social mobility and the access to middle class and good jobs on the part of people who in a previous era would have found economic security in sort of you know, um, secure, unionized, uh, blue collar, uh, but still relatively well-playing jobs uh, in manufacturing industries. And that's the disappearance of those kinds of jobs uh, that is really causing the problem, or that's what you're focusing on. You know, these people are not poor uh, by the standards of even uh, um, their own economies. Uh, but there is a sense that something might be happening in the middle as well that might be concerned. So um, those three rows refer to sort of you know, different segments of the uh, income distribution that you might be concerned about. The columns uh, relate to a taxonomy of the types of interventions or sort of where one may want to intervene. And here, the usual distinction is, um, is uh, um, I think it was first used by Jacob Hacker at Yale, was pre-distribution versus distribution. When Jacob Hacker made that, that distinction, so he was talking about sort of pre-distribution in his terminology is really the first two columns. Uh, what happens before taxes um, and transfers kicks in? and distribution is really the system of taxes and transfers. So the, the thinking is that sort of, you know, the, the market does its job, and then once the market is, you know, people get their uh, paychecks, 
people make their investments, get their returns, um, all the market returns are realized. And then the state steps in um, through its tax and transfer system uh, to redistribute income. So there's a progressive tax system, there are you know, aid to uh, children, uh, or aid to poor families, uh, there might be unemployment insurance to people who might have lost their jobs. There might be pensions and old age insurance for people. So those are all being paid out of taxes um, after the markets have delivered. Um, in this uh, schema, I've divided the pre-distribution stage, that is what happens before the state kicks in directly through taxes and redistribution. Um, I've divided it into a, a production stage and a pre-production stage. I think that's a, a useful um, distinction, uh, particularly from our own standpoint, because I think one of the things that we want to make um, clear here is the type of um, pre-distribution policies that essentially are focusing on the endowments of individuals and families through investments in their education, in their health, uh, uh, in their sort of in their networks um, that actually prepare people and families and young to enter labor markets and the markets and the economy. And then sort of the production stage uh, interventions that are directly affecting uh, by changing prices, uh, by changing incentives, um, of investors, producers, employers, innovators in the type of decisions that they make. So uh, that's the distinction between pre-production and production stage. So the production stage interventions um, uh, are interventions that directly affect uh, employment, production, investment, innovation decisions by changing uh, 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 the incentives or through regulating directly uh, those decisions. So that gives us a, a kind of a three by three matrix of different range of things. So when you think about the welfare state, for example, I think the welfare state largely focused on the first and the third column. Um, in the first column, it was largely sort of this ability to invest in education and health, uh, to equalize life chances from the outset. And secondly, sort of, you know, the redistribution was through social insurance mechanisms, unemployment insurance, and other social insurance mechanisms that would take care of those who would fall through the cracks. So the idea was that if you, had the, if you have the adequate endowments, you have your health, your education, your basic supports, uh, then the good jobs and sort of the production, employment, innovation decisions that you would be a full participant in those that the production decisions would not disadvantage you if you entered the system uh, with basic life chances are equalized through these endowments, investments in endowments. Now, of course, some people would lose their jobs. Some people might end up without enough savings for retirement. That's why you would need that in the third column to redistribute I you know, incomes after the fact. But the traditional conception of the welfare state is largely on the first and the third column. Now, if you think as I do, that changes in the fundamental economy because of existing trends in globalization and technology uh, is making it more difficult on, it on the current path for the economy to generate good, decent employment opportunities. Uh, then you have to worry about sort of what those investment, employment, innovation decisions are, and then you have to intervene there as well. In other words, it's, no, it's not much use to prepare people for jobs that may not reasonably exist or to expect that people will have the kinds of skills uh, that are too far from their current endowments um, by simply saying, well, you know, these technologies require you know, investments in skill and education and that's why we're, going, we're not going to double up our investments in skills and education when it's not really realistic. Uh, under any kind of time frame uh, to actually uh, bring the vast majority of the labor force to the level of skills and training that uh, they could take advantage of the sort of advanced technologies and the knowledge economy. And that therefore might require a set of interventions that are much more in the 
uh, second column, particularly in the second cell, and that's where sort of most of the good jobs policies that, uh, that uh, uh, I discuss in my piece with, with um, um, uh, Chuck Sable uh, would, be, would be located. But um, so uh, let, me, let me just uh, stop here. Um, Shall we give shall a we chance to the class? See if we have uh, some questions or comments before we. Yes, please. Yeah, so that's a, that's a good question. Uh, you know, as, as 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 it happens, I am talking with the Ministry of uh, uh, the Economy and Trade and, and Industry um, in, uh, in in Japan on these issues. Uh, so one one thing is to say that to go back re r to remind ourselves that the traditional distinction uh, in Japan, uh, as much as anywhere else, was was predicated on the notion that, for example, if the Ministry of Economy uh, prepared uh, the conditions under which you would have globally competitive industries, um, and that this would create um, sort of a broad-based uh, 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 prosperity. So how might the current conditions modify that understanding? What's happening is that uh, many of those globally competitive industries are not going to be generating uh, jobs uh, for the majority of the, the, the labor force. And of course, you know, Japan has traditionally been one of these economies of where this duality between very productive jobs in the uh, export-oriented industries and somewhat less productive jobs in the non-traded and the domestic sector has been very striking uh, from, from very early on. But in an environment where, in fact, that uh, productive uh, manufacturing or the high-tech sector necessarily uh, becomes a kind of an island in the economy and doesn't have the ability to absorb a lot of labor because on current paths, that's mostly very highly skilled, very capital intensive sort of industries. Um, that has consequences not just for equity in the sense of there'll be some people who left out of those opportunities. You might say, well, that's really the, the job of the social security ministry or something else. But it is that economic growth as a whole is kept down because you don't have the ability to s disseminate these technologies. You don't have the ability to grow these industries with your current resources because they remain you know, a relatively small part of the economy. That might mean that the kind of industries that you would promote, the kind of, you know, might no longer be the globally competitive manufacturing industries. The most high-tech industries with the most capital intensive or skill intensive technologies you might want to change your strategy to see, are there, are there innovations or the type of technology that we might promote? Or should we think about incentives, changing our sets of R&D incentives, our, our regulations in a way that would actually promote these large firms to think more about the unemployment consequences? So this, you know, thinking about more employment-friendly technologies. When we think about our investment subsidies, our tax code, um, how we provide assistance to small and medium-sized enterprises. Should we directly emphasize the employment target much more and how we can promote greater link-up between the large and more competitive firms and their suppliers and the smaller and medium-sized enterprises? Um, again, so it's not to change the objective of the Ministry of Economy. It's still to grow the economy. Uh, but growth now might require a very different um, set of instruments, a different approach. Uh, that is, you know, sort of, um, uh, you know, that, that is no longer simply focusing on global competitiveness of the large firms and the high-tech sector, but this, you know, sort of a segment of the economy that might be much more inward-focused, much more small and medium-sized enterprises, 
and, and, and innovation programs that are perhaps more focused on those segments. So that's why I would say that it, would be, it wouldn't necessarily, yes, that, that coordination is always helpful, but I think it's, it might be more than that to the extent that the objective of the Ministry of Economy and the instruments that need to be pursued are also affected by this way of thinking. It's very much the second rather than the first, although you can still use this matrix, you can still this typology if you thought that the issue was really the first. So you can then say this is really about whatever growth policies you're pursuing, if you're thinking about you know, equity, you know, this might still help you think about what kind of policies to apply for that. So you don't have to buy into my uh, you know, sort of preference of that second interpretation to find this potentially useful. But the reason I say it's the first is, um, you know, there's a, there's a, there is a long line of thinking where, in terms of, of economics, that this strict separation between the first fundamental theorem and the second fundamental theorem, you know, in practice are not separate. So just, you know, the first fundamental theorem of economics is that, you know, a competitive market economy is efficient. So that uh, tells you that, you know, sh the state really should, uh, you know, stay out because if you have competition you get efficiency um, and therefore the state. The second fundamental theorem of welfare economics is that you can achieve efficiency with any amount of redistribution you want to do at the in the background. So the second says that look it's not like we don't care about inequality it's just that you know redistribute resources and then let the markets work and you'll still get the efficiency. So this this allows you this neat separation between efficiency and inequality as long as you're doing the redistribution not through price distortions uh, so ideally through some redistribution endowments and uh, so that already fails from very standard models so for example when uh, people are constrained in the investments that they make by collateral so one of the fundamental uh, fail fu fundamental market failures would be asymmetric information I have a good project, I go to the bank and I say, can you please loan me money because I have a good project and the bank says, how do I know you have a good project? You're just claiming it, you'll just take the money and run. Or you'll take the money, the good project turns out to be a bad project and then you, know, you can't pay me back. Um, so uh, therefore, then in practice, the way that the banks will you know, try to overcome this is by you know, making sure you have some skin in the game Right, so you know you have to pull up a collateral. Um, so collateral is a response to um, asymmetric information in finance. But what does that mean? It means that you know who has collateral. You know you have to have wealth. You have to have the contacts. So you, if you're a poor person with a genuinely good idea, you're not you know because you're not able to put up collateral, uh, you know you're not able to undertake a good investment. So here is a fundamental way in which inefficiency is undermined uh, by uh, inequity because you know sort of these wealth constraints mean that you cannot achieve the most efficient outcome in the sense that good ideas don't get realized if they are you know poor people are as prone to having good ideas as as wealthy people so already you know in that context this you know the you know this neat separation between uh, you know efficiency and growth so that's a standard kind of a way but the, what I'm saying is that you know, this, has, this has moved from becoming a kind of a debating argument 
to being a much more of a central. Arguments of this type have become much more central. And that's the sense in which I think economists and economic policymakers are starting to think that they are in a, you know, inevitably and inter you know, inextricably linked. And the kind of example that I gave of wealth constraints uh, is not just a you know, kind of a debating argument from the left, uh, but it's a much more fundamental problem because of the, the other kinds of examples I've cited. All right. Yeah, I think that, that that's very good. But I'll rephrase I'll rephrase your criticism. Uh, uh, the issue with using the language of externalities is not that those are sort of quantifiable and so forth, uh, because many many externalities are in fact not <laughs> quantifiable. But it is because they're using market language. So I think that's the I think that's that's the hitting. You know, that's the, the really strong part I think of 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 the criticism is to say that. Are you really subverting the agenda that you really should have by using kind of a market language, taking markets, reifying markets because you know it's a failure that asks you to cause, as opposed to some fundamental rights or some sort of fundamental, you know, basic uh, attachment to you know, human development and things of that kind. Um, I, I mean, you're 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 completely right, and I don't want at all to dismiss the notion that you want to approach many of these issues from this, you know, a kind of a rights-based approach, you know, human dignity, um, you, know, you, know, full, you know, full development of human potential and all of that. So I'm not, uh, I think that's absolutely right. But the power of using the market language is actually to also subvert the discussion in economics uh, and, and to direct it uh, in, in an appropriate direction. So that, um, to the, and I think, the, you know, the externality point precisely links up with the discussion we were having before. If you can show using economics language that even the fundamental tenets of you know, economics uh, require an approach that might be consistent with a sort of a, a separate track of thinking on rights-based or human potential, uh, human fulfillment kind of an approach, then economics can become an ally. Uh, it doesn't have to be uh, an, an enemy, I think that's important because I do think economics has tools to bring in uh, to that agenda, um, including a kind of a f you know fully rights-based agenda. Because the issue becomes, how do we achieve that? You know, the resource allocation questions are not going to disappear. Um, so, uh, so, so, I, I guess what I'm saying is, um, so I hope that using the terminology of s or some of the conceptual tools of economics. Uh, takes the agenda further rather than, uh, than, than, than retards it. Well, I mean, I, so the, 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 the if, if you're, if um, I think the, 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 the debate right now, if that's, uh, if I'm going to see correctly on, 
both the sources and um, and possible approaches for dealing with inflation essentially is sort of the, the orthodox uh, approach is to say that, that you know, rising prices is, is really due um, partly to sort of some supply side constraints, but uh, increasingly largely because of sort of the lingering threat of an increase in aggregate demand um, and, and the fiscal response to, to the COVID shock. And, and then the, the orthodox remedy uh, is to, to tighten up money, raise interest rates, um, and, and, and so forth. And then the, the counter, the, 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 um, the um, and then there is a line of argument uh, on the part of some progressive economists to, to say, well, uh, you know, that, that some of the inflation uh, might be due to uh, oligopolistic pricing behavior on the part of large firms. Um, and that, uh, that uh, you know, rather than penalizing and punishing sort of lower and middle classes through higher interest rates and, and tightening the money that you might be better off uh, dealing with issues of market conduct uh, better. I think it, it's, it, as in economics usually, I mean, you can actually c write down, you know, models of practically anything and ultimately it becomes sort of, you know, what is more uh, compatible with the evidence. Um, what are the different implications of these different models that to the extent you can navigate them in, in, in the evidence and in the data. So you need to be able to make some of these distinctions because, you know, if everything, you know, you know in a holistic world where everything aff affects everything else, you don't have any way of reaching a conclusion. And so if you think about it as this, these kind of two polar opposite kind of arguments uh, and being distinct arguments, you can say, well, you know, uh, you know, a constant doesn't explain a change, and then you'd have to say, you know, what has changed to explain, you know, increasing in prices, and you know, there you're, you're you're likely to find that there is more evidence that this might be due to aggregate demand, aggregate supply, rather than you know, sort of oligopolistic behavior. But I, I think that's sort of going to take us a little bit away from 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 our focus currently. So I don't want to go. Uh, yeah, maybe I misunderstood. Um, Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I mean, so if the, if actually the the firms are less competitive, then actually, you know, in some sense, it's better for organized labor because then if they are able to rise raise their wages, then most standard economic models would predict that there's less than full price through into p into prices. So if wages are double price, I mean wages rise by 50. D you know, prices are likely to rise by f you know 20 or 25. Whereas if everything is competitive, you know firms have fully to reflect. They can't absorb anything into profits because they don't have any excess profits. So you know, f you know the rise in wages have to be uh, have to show up. But we know that a lot of the the changes in wages in the last few decades have come through reduction in labor share of the enterprise surplus that suggests that there is actually a lot of wiggle room that a lot of the labor share in the enterprise surplus can be increased without necessarily uh, inc you know, uh, increasing prices a lot so presumably there is some wiggle room there but we should maybe um, just I think we should move on and then maybe come back to this okay so uh, th our theme is inequality and I propose to, to address it by enunciating and defending three principles. So the first principle is that everything that we can do to change the fundamental or primary distribution of economic advantage and disadvantage overshadows in importance whatever we do to correct 
the primary distribution and to produce what we might call the secondary or derivative distribution. So for that purpose, I'm putting on one side those initiatives that Danny qualified as pre-production and production, and on the other side, those that he qualified as post-production. So the first thesis is saying what we can do to change the basic distribution that arises before any after-the-fact correction of what the market has generated is much more important than what we can do to correct the market after the fact. That's the basic thesis. And that thesis is reflected in the rhetorical apparatus of a tension between equity and efficiency on which Danny just cast doubt. But I believe that a great deal of power remains in that tension. And it is reaffirmed by the conversations we had earlier in the course about the consequences of dualism. So dualism has to do with the organization of the economy, uh, the hierarchical segmentation of the production system, especially, between an insular vanguard and everyone else, the vast periphery or rear guard of the economy. And the brunt of this first thesis is that whatever we can do to change that original situation will be much more important and effective than any attempt to correct its consequences after the fact by retrospective and compensatory redistribution. And the intuitive idea behind this thesis uh, is that if the structural inequality is deep and entrenched, the attempt to correct it by after-the-fact redistribution will have to be massive. And long before it reaches the requisite dimension of magnitude, it will begin to destabilize the arrangements and incentives on which the established economic order depends. So we can't set up an economy in a certain way and say, whatever it does by way of inequality, we can just correct after the fact. We won't be able to correct it after the fact, except within very strict limits, for that reason which I've just stated. Now, before going any further to my second principle, let me pause and reflect more generally on the significance of the ideal of equality in our political debates around the world. So the established model of ideological controversy around the world is shallow freedom against shallow equality. The right are those who accord priority to freedom against the background of the established institutional arrangements, economic and political. And the left are those who give priority to equality against the background of the same institutional arrangements. What I mean by calling them shallow has to do precisely with this acquiescence in the established institutional arrangements. So it is common now among institutionally conservative social democrats and their philosophers or ideologists to affirm an egalitarian profession of faith. But that egalitarian profession of faith is then combined with institutional skepticism or conservatism. What is the practical consequence of that addition of the egalitarian faith 
with the institutional conservatism or skepticism. It's to place the whole focus of the egalitarianism on corrective after the fact redistribution. And this consequence is perfectly expressed in the theories of corrective justice that are now ascendant in the Anglo-American world, like the Rawlsian theory of justice. They are, in fact, philosophical or pseudo-philosophical props to the homely practices of corrective redistribution under institutionally conservative social democracy. If you didn't think that was the problem, you wouldn't go about philosophizing in that way. Now, what happens then if we lift the constraint that I call shallowness, and we imagine uh, a deep equality? Uh, so, and we say, everything that the market has done, we will take back, despite the economic consequences in foregone output. Uh, and the objective will be an equality of outcome or of circumstance or some approximation to it. Now, it seems to me completely clear that this has never been the objective. The, the objective has never been this equality, which we could call deep equality, like some myth of the ancient Spartans or the ancient Romans being equally poor together. Uh, that wasn't the objective of the 19th century liberals and socialists, of Karl Marx or John Stuart Mill. What was their objective? Their objective was a greater life for the ordinary man and woman, even though their conception of this shared greatness was too narrowly conceived on the aristocratic model of self-possession. And what was their method? Their method was institutional or structural change. Each faction of the 19th century liberals or socialists had a different formula of institutional change, a different dogma. So uh, I then want to take the side of the 19th century in this debate and say, the way in which we should conceive the essential difference between the right and the left is not how vociferous we are in our commitment to an egalitarian ideal. There are two fundamental differences. One difference is the willingness to defy the established institutional arrangements, the willingness not to take them as the unsurpassable horizon of our political projects, to go beyond this horizon by institutional change. And the second difference between the right and the left is intangible or philosophical. The conservatives are the ones who believe that it is natural for human life to be small. Natural for it to be small for the ordinary man and women, unless they're released from this smallness by the emergencies of war or of national calamity. And the progressives are the ones who believe that it's not natural for human life to be small and that we can all become bigger together. We can ascend to a higher form of life with greater scope, greater intensity, greater capability, but we must ascend together or not at all. And therefore, it is this combination of the ideal, as I've just defined it, of a shared empowerment or greatness, and of a disposition to transgress the limits of the institutional framework that should define the distinction between the progressives and the conservatives. But in the implementation of this view, we have an unprecedented problem, a problem without historical precedent. 
like the liberals and socialists of the 19th century, we have reason to affirm the primacy of structural alternatives, like the anti-dualist alternatives that we discussed earlier in the course. But unlike them, we also have reason to resist dogmatic institutional blueprints. And therefore, we have a problem, a task, without historical precedent, which is how to affirm the primacy of structural alternatives without succumbing to a structural dogmatism. Uh, now I come to my second principle. Against the background of this first thesis, that everything that shapes the primary distribution is much more important than whatever we can do to correct it after the fact. The second thesis is that correction nevertheless has a legitimate and indispensable role in extending and deepening our achievements by the fundamental institutional change. But to understand properly this fundamental role, we have to take the budget as a whole. On both its revenue-raising side, taxation, and its spending side, public spending and social entitlements. And we have to assess the effect on inequality as a whole. Now, when we do this, we confront a paradox, an enigma, which is manifest in the comparative fiscal experience of the contemporary North Atlantic democracies. The country that on paper has the relatively most progressive tax system is by far the most unequal, the United States. The European social democracies, far more egalitarian, have tax systems that are organized around an avowedly regressive tax, the comprehensive flat rate value added tax, or some functional equivalent to it. So, for example, in France, there is no general comprehensive flat rate value added tax. But there are a series of taxes, a crazy quilt of particular forms of taxation that have overall the same functional direction. They are indirect, transaction-oriented, and consumption-based taxes. How are we to explain this paradox? The fundamental explanation of the paradox is that what matters most in the egalitarian corrective effect of the tax system, what matters most over the short term is not how progressive taxes are, the revenue raising side of the budget. It's simply the aggregate level of the tax take and how it is spent. The basic fiscal reason why the European social democracies manage to achieve a higher redistributive effect is that they take at least 10% of GDP more in by way of public revenue than does the United States. That's the fundamental reason. And what's the relation between this higher tax take and their recourse to an avowedly regressive tax like the value-added tax. You have to understand what the value-added tax is conceptually. Imagine the economy as a vast input-output table, and the value-added tax takes a constant proportion of the value of the transformation of every input into an output. So by definition, conceptually, if it is left pu pure, if it is generalized, it is the tax that is most neutral 
with respect to the system of relative prices. And it therefore makes it possible to maximize the tax take while minimizing the economic trauma in the disturbance of established incentives to invest, save, and employ. So it is possible for the Europeans to take in much more, but to minimize the resulting economic confusion and cost. And then everything that they lose by way of progressivity on the revenue raising side of the budget, they gain in double on the spending side. That's how it happens. But what happens in the United States is that the progressives, especially at election time, the progressive politicians, always reaffirm their fidelity to the principle of progressive taxation. Because they obviously prefer gestures to progressive pieties to the achievement of progressive effects. They know, or they should know, that these progressive taxes have only a marginal effect on actual distribution, but uh, they want to show whose side they are, they're on. And that is the real significance of this political rhetoric of genuflection to the principle of progressive taxation. The progressives might want a larger tax take, but they can't stand a regressive tax. And the conservatives don't want a larger tax take, and they like a, a regressive tax. So no one favors in the United States the alternative that I've just stated and defended, which is to have a much larger tax take based on a regressive foundation. Now I come to my third principle. It's down the hierarchy. The first principle is more important than the second. The second is more important than the third. Once we have established the tax system on this basis of consumption, it is easy to add a heavily progressive element if we want. It's not going to replace the structural change, the first principle, but it will extend it. Now, in principle, what are the chief targets of progressive taxation? They are two. The first target is the hierarchy of standards of living, what people spend on themselves. And the second target is the accumulation and exercise of economic power. The second target is much harder to reach than the first target through the tax system because it's directly entangled in the institutional organization of the economy. And by far the most effective way to reach it is at death. The most effective way to deal with the, extra, with the accumulation and exercise of economic power is the suppression, as far as we can, of the hereditary transmission of property or of its anticipation through gifts inter vivos. Uh, and what about then the first target, the hierarchy of standards of living? There is a highly effective way to reach that target, and it is an individualized tax on consumption which taxes on a steeply progressive rate the difference between the aggregate income of the individual, returns to capital and to labor altogether, and the demonstrated invested savings. That difference. That difference is what the individual spends on himself. And it is the basis, then, of the hierarchy of the standards of living in society. The income tax is an ineffective tax. It's a confused and hybrid tax. It doesn't hit either of these targets directly. And in practice, all around the world, the income tax is basically a tax on the salaries of the so-called middle class. Rich people don't pay income tax. 
So the income tax is not a sensible tax. Uh, now, this tax that I've described is sometimes called the Caldor tax because it was most eminently theorized by Nicholas Caldor, a disciple of Keynes, in the book that he published in 1955, I believe, an expenditure tax. It has no difficulties of administration other than the difficulties of the income tax. It's no different or harder to administer. Whatever the individual does not demonstrate as invested savings counts as if it had been spent and is therefore taxed. So if the individual receives below a certain level of income, he doesn't pay anything. He receives something. That's what the Americans call the negative income tax. As you go up the, hi the, the hierarchy of expense, the marginal rate rises steeply. And now comes what I consider the most attractive particularity of this tax. The highest marginal rate is not 100%. It has no top marginal rate. So above a certain level of lux luxury living, one could say, the for every dollar that the individual spends, he pays four to the government. The top marginal rate is 400%. Fine. So we want corrective redistribution through the tax system? This is the way to get it. The sky's the limit. There's no limit. The only limit is political power and political will. Uh, so uh, these three principles are then the, the, the the outline of a position about this problem. And of course, one of, their one, of its, one of the difficulties of this position is that it's complicated. It's paradoxical. So it would require the statesmen to explain this to the people. And I believe that it can be explained in a language that everyone can understand. So your ideal tax system is a, is a progressive consumption tax combined with an inheritance tax? Yes. Okay. Although I should say, I'm not an enthusiast, an enthusiast of taxes altogether. It's way down in the hierarchy, right? Compared to the other things. I understand. But just to be clear on the, on the tax side, and, and yes. so you would prefer the inheritance tax or wealth tax? I think uh, a wealth tax has all sorts of problems, but as I said, the exercise of economic power is best reached through institutional change, not through the tax system. Uh, and there is one way of reaching it through the tax system, and which is, which is the inheritance. And we know how, how, how hard it is. Not many years ago in the United States, the two then richest men in the country, Bill Gates and Warren Buffett, organize a national campaign in favor of the estate tax, its preservation. And they took out full page advertisements in the American newspapers, and they failed. They failed to convince their fellow citizens, their penniless fellow citizens, that it was worthwhile defending the estate tax. So that would be another conversation to comment on that. So that's one of the striking things about that, that both the inheritance tax or the, or as it's called here, the death tax, um, or um, even, but also in Europe, the inherit is, is incredibly unpopular. Yes. So is the, so is the consumption tax. So yes. That it's, it's, uh, but coming to the, 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 the most important part, which you emphasize the priority one, is, is that it, what, what really matters is the scale of spending. You, you didn't say anything that's about That's the, the second top. principle, not the first, right? The second. No, the, sec the first principle is that, that you ought to, through spending, or the role of fiscal policy is to target. That's the, target the second policy. principle. The first principle is, the is that what we do to reshape the fundamental distribution through institutional change overshadows everything else. The second principle is that in the short term, with respect to the budget, it's the total picture that matters. Right. 
So what would be the content of a progressive um, fiscal policy on the, on the spending side? On the spending side, so. So wha why, why, why do you so want I to think the, So I, I think there we can be guided by historical experience. What is the greatest achievement of European social democracy, of which I am a critic? The greatest, greatest historical achievement was to have maintained a high level of investment in people and in their capabilities, paradoxically financed by the regressive taxation of consumption. And that's an achievement that we should seek to preserve, to imitate, and to develop. Uh, so generalizing from that historical achievement, what I would say is we should think of it as what I called in an earlier class the haven. So much of our discussion is about the storm, the storm of innovation, of disruption. But the counterpart to the storm is that the individual should be secure in a haven of safeguards against private and public oppression and of endowment insuring of, and, and of capability assuring endowments. That's the haven. And the, the imitation of this achievement of European social democracy seems to me to be the natural point of departure for the development of this haven through universal basic income, through social inheritance, through forms of giving every agent, every worker and citizen a basic package of endowments and rights on which he can draw at turning points in his life. So we should uh, get some uh, comments or questions, but do you have any, any, any sense of this, you know, the, the puzzle of the lack of popularity of both the consumption tax and the inheritance tax? Well, they're different things, right? I mean, the, pr the problem of the consumption, uh, oh, you, you mean the individual consumption tax? Right. Yes. So. Or the, or the VAT. I mean, the, no, the well, uh, yeah, but that's a different discussion, right? Because there, there's an obvious, the paradox of regressivity having a progressive effect and so forth. So. It's interesting because many public finance experts, many of the tax jurists, the, the, the lawyers who teach tax law in the United States, are defenders of this tax, and they've got nowhere. Uh, so that, that is, so I mean, this is, this is, it's this striking. is one part of the course where you're thoroughly um, aligned with economy. Well, I'm, I'm allied with expert opinion in its <laughs> narrow range, yes. Uh, I don't think they like the, 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 the content or implications of my first principle so much, but they certainly do get on board with this principle. I think, I think even on the first principle, I mean, I think, um, you know, the, I think most economists would agree with me that, you know, the, the first problem is really what matters, is, um. is, is the endowments. Uh, that, that's, I think, that's, uh, um, so, I hate to tell you that you're very conventional. Yes, that's right. So, so. <laughs> So I think, th but, but this, is, this is something fundamental, right? So in these societies, in these somewhat pagan societies with limited hopes, the individual imagines himself as standing at the wheel of fortune, right? Uh, and so th there's this spiritual element that's part of the spiritual back backdrop. And what can he hope for? He can hope to win the lottery. And uh, these ideas are the suppression of the lottery. Michelle? Yeah. Yeah. 
Yes, but I think there's a, the, your reference to France there suggests uh, a, a partial commentary, not really an explanation, but a commentary on the issue that Danny just posed. But it's something very important to understand. So the general perspective of the masses in the world, I'm not talking just about France, is not a proletarian perspective. This is something that the left has trouble understanding. The general orientation of the masses in the world is petty bourgeois. The, the, the aspiration in the world is to ascend to a modicum of independent prosperity. And, thus by, and, the, and the, the tangible image of that, by default, because of the lack of other things, is small-scale family property, your own little farm, your little store, your own little business. That's the model by default. Now, I think that what would have to happen with, for the progressives in the world is that instead of combating this aspiration, they try to understand it and to meet it on its own terms. So, in other words, to provide a broader menu of ways in which this aspiration could be achieved and magnified, made more generous, more magnanimous, more compatible with forms of cooperation and solidarity. That's what the leftists should do. And, and so I think that that element is present in this antipathy to inheritance because the would-be or actual petty bourgeois wants to say, no, but they won't touch my farm or my house, which I'm going to give to my family and so forth. So I think that's, that's part of the background. But I, and but that I has think to you be were, contemplated. Uh, well, sorry. Yes. But just to complement that, I think what you were also saying is that there is a correlation um, with um, general trust in, in the institutions and in particular in, in public institutions, in the government. Uh, with whether people are more likely to, um, and it is in fact the, 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 the case that it's not entirely clear the French estate tax works quite yes, like well. in and, and it's often said that levels of distrust so are very high exactly. in France. So but I will say the following on the other side, not with respect to France, but with respect to Europe specifically. The European social democracy has been hollowed out, it's been liberalized. It's retreated. It's given up many of these safeguards against economic insecurity. It's given up the incomes policy. But what it has retreated to is the last line of defense. And the last line of defense is this high level of social entitlements funded by the regressive taxation of consumption. Now, it is a striking fact that no conservative government in a major European country has ever managed to achieve any major dent in this level of high social entitlements. So it's never been reversed in, in politics. And that's because there is obviously a social compact, a social contract. You give me a high level of entitlements and I'll pay a high level of taxation. And that's been maintained in Europe despite all of this liberalization and hollowing out, and contrary to the implications of distrust. Yes? No, I don't understand. So this model of the value added tax is not a speculation. This is what exists. So we have experience of this. And we know that a, 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 a relatively high level of value added tax is compatible with a prosperous market economy. We know that for a fact, uh, because it's a basic feature 
of these existing systems. So I don't think that should be in dispute. Yeah, a consumption tax or, or, a, or a value added tax doesn't yes. alter production incentives, so it doesn't, doesn't have adverse uh, supply side. Uh, uh, in that way, it's much better than an income tax, for example, that alters the margin between working and investing versus not working, uh, which has part of the problems that you're alluding to, but the consumption tax wouldn't have that. Madla? Of course, you can ask a question on production. <laughs> we both believe in the in the primacy of production. <laughs> <sir. Uh, uh, you know, d would you want to say something about the peculiarities of Japanese economy as well as to what extent the whole Nsoskis view reflects, because it's sort of a, a little bit um, out, of out of date as well, pro maybe with respect to Japan. It
So Japan couldn't quite make the transition after the, the sort of very successful export-oriented uh, growth model that was built on some peculiar Japanese institutions like these um, uh, large corporations with lifetime employment, you know, job stability, uh, investment, long-term investment supported by the state in the midst of a, a rather unproductive, non-tradable uh, sector of, of services and so forth where, you know, in a, in a way, you know, it was less a welfare state but more like, you know, mom and pop stores and employment in, in the in, in the service sector that provided a kind of, of, of basic uh, social insurance. Um, but once sort of that model through the financial bubble phase and its bursting ran its course, there was not a, a kind of a, Japan, along with actually I would say maybe to today South Korea is another example of that. They have not been able to uh, invent a new model in a new way of, of, of going forward. Um, that's um, and then I think the fiscal austerity. So maybe the maybe the problem with consumption taxing um, was less, you know, because I think when Roberto was talking about consumption taxation as as just basically a, as a system of taxation, but what happened in Japan, of course, is worry about excessive debt and worry about fiscal deficits led to excessive fiscal austerity. The instrument for that was consumption taxes. Um, and, and that probably was not the right remedy to that kind of a situation that you know, created the kind of you know, doldrums and ongoing stagnation and decline that the Japanese uh, so, uh, so, so yeah, there's one thing I want to unpack and make entirely clear. In the statement of the first principle, structural change overshadows everything else. The primary distribution is more important than the secondary distribution. The, the main content today of that structural change would be the anti-dualist initiatives that we've been discussing earlier in the course. That's the content. It's, there's a division between the insular vanguard and the rest. There's an educational dualism. So the attack on this dualism, both, economic, both productive and educational, is the most important thing. And it is then amplified by the other themes of a progressive political economy having to do with the relation of labor to capital and the relation of finance to the real economy. So one question here in this discussion is how much of that is a matter of fiscal resources? In other words, raising enough taxes so that you can actually pay for investments in these endowments? Yes. How much of it is the way that the government actually organizes itself. So it's some part is organizational and doesn't depend on money, but it's clear that money is also important f to finance, for example, the industrial equivalent to agricultural extension. That does take money to create the network of, of technical schools that educate the working, the, the labor force in this new set of generic conceptual skills, those things take money. The state must be financed. And I would say the current level of tax take in the United States is incompatible with any progressive or productivist program. So it is a fundamental problem of the country. No, very briefly, uh, India for a few years, I think, Sri Lanka, but there's practically no experience with it. And so technical constraints of implementation, none. The technical difficulties of the Caldor tax are exactly the same as those of the income tax with which there's worldwide experience. So the objections to it, whatever they are, are not technical. Because, I mean, in the context of developing countries, the main issue is, is, you know, you don't have good sources of documentation on income. And so withholding becomes the major source of, of income uh, uh, um, taxation for the middle classes, and um, the rich have a lot of vehicles for evading it. 
and of course the consumption tax would face the same problem uh, as well. However, the reason that the VAT has been very successful, now the VAT has been extremely successful around the developing countries because it's, uh, it, it's not uh, imposed on, it's a transaction-based tax, so it's, it's not- It's not a declaratory it's tax, so it's, it's not, automatic. You don't have to document your income or it doesn't have to be. And it, it's, a, and it's, um, it's the kind of, of tax that it's relatively easy to collect because uh, there is an incentive for um, establishments to report or you know to um, their you know their transactions because they can they can withhold the payments on their inputs because it's a value added tax each establishment pays something that pays on its re revenues minus its uh, its uh, its inputs so you want each establishment wants to document its um, its purchases from others. So it can subtract it from its tax liability, which in turn makes it hard for the supplier of those inputs to evade those taxes. Um, so in that way, it's been a uh, it's been very successful even in countries with relatively low uh, tax uh, administrative um, capabilities to impose it. So in that form, the VAT has been uh, consumption taxation has been successful in developing countries and quite widespread. Sure. Uh, well, I mean, just one maybe they're very expensive. <laughs> so what? Ab so what it it's the strange business of treating returns to capital different from returns to labor. You could just fold them into a single source and deal with them. I would say not through the income tax, but through this other this other way of taxing. No, the, mar the, the, the super rich already have a very high marginal propensity to save. What do we want? Would we want them to buy more champagne, more, more perfume? Maybe some austerity would do them good, but I, 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 that, that's a non-existent effect. It's so, so inconsequential. If, if you're super rich, money is unlimited, right? So it doesn't exist. So you're worried about the deflationary effect of the consumption tax? We would increase. On one side, the deflationary effect. On, on our side, on the other side, uh, 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 there was an effect of the inequality, as you can see here, with actually very low, right? Yes. So then you have this problem of accumulation as economic power, and that's what you have to hit through other devices. Well, I mean, again, I think the inheritance tax would take care of some of this problem, right? So that, that we know, I think, it, it, I think it's, a, it's a legitimate concern, especially since we know that the, the, w the wealthy tend to earn a much higher rate of return on their savings than, than the less wealthy. So that would be a mechanism absent uh, the inheritance tax for the exacerbation yeah. of intergenerational uh, inequality. But the inheritance tax would be one way to, uh, to, uh, to take care of that. I think we have a very interesting example in the world of the conflict uh, between the social democratic state and, a, and plutocratic dynasties, which is Sweden. You know, Swe if, if the world could vote, it wouldn't vote to be the United States, it would vote to be Sweden. But it would vote to be an imaginary Sweden, the Sweden of the 1970s, as they imagine it. Because what in fact happened in Sweden was over many decades, a conflict between the social democratic state and the familial plutocracies that own, to this day, much of the Swedish economy. So 
the Swedish state entered into a compromise with these familial plutocracies, expropriated some of their powers, required them to put these assets in trusts that are regulated in various ways. Uh, and that's what exists. So the world, looking at Sweden, sees this epilogue of the high level of entitlements and doesn't see the preceding narrative. So it wants the epilogue without the narrative. That's what we have in Brazil, for example, my country. Every politician claims to, until recently, claim to be some kind of leftist. Social this, social that, social democrat, social liberal. That's everyone. And what do they mean by social? What they mean is the sugar. It's the distribution of the sugar with which they, with which they uh, conceal the economic model, the bigger economic model. They'll sugarcoat it. And that's the essential theme of political discourse. How will we sugarcoat the economic model? So all of these conversations that we have could be summarized in the principle of what's the alternative to sugarcoating? That's what we've been discussing. So what I think of that, and that's this is what, what I said, the aim is not deep equality. The aim is deep freedom. So uh, I don't think there's, a, I, I think that there's no reason to give very great value to any kind of rough equality of outcome or of circumstance. Extreme inequality, entrenched inequality is bad, is perverse, because it corrupts relations among people among groups in society, creates a class society, and so forth. So the outcome could be roughly described as as much equality as is necessary for everyone to be have access to empowerment together. And that means a lot of equality in, in, in relation to the existing societies of the world. But the idea that the metric of the should be some kind of radical equalization, I think is, is fanciful. And what it means in practice, when it's combined with this institutional conservatism, is we'll just have some corrective redistribution. That's the theories of justice that we have. One aspect of, of inequality that, that we have not talked about is actually uh, global inequality. I mean, some of that we'll come back to when we talk about globalization. Uh, but uh, and we've talked mostly today almost exclusively about uh, inequality within countries. And the question, one question is um, um, whether there is any, any tension between uh, achieving more inequality within countries and achieving greater no. global... Uh, so I think we agree that the initiative that would have the most dramatic effect on global inequality would be any gain in the mobility of labor across national frontiers. Of course, it can't be achieved instantaneously or suddenly. It has to be achieved stepwise with safeguards for the receiving countries and compensations for the sending countries. But I have the impression that that trumps in causal efficacy everything else. Yeah, I mean, I, I, think, I think that's right. So um, getting some, you know, bringing poor people from the developing countries into rich countries and giving them jobs there would be the most, uh, um, you know, effective way of, of in increasing uh, global uh, equality. Um, but there, it would there, be world a, revolution, right? I mean, if we were to well institute a, this rapidly. I mean, there's a version of that that happens under hyperglobalization when countries like the United States um, uh, increase their imports of labor 
intensive goods being exported, most importantly from China, but a whole variety of uh, then very low income countries. Uh, it wasn't the people who were moving, but it was their services who were being traded through, um, through, uh, uh, through trade and goods. And we know that that had, at least in, in the United States, um, some adverse effects on inequality and significant disruption of labor markets and, and was one of the contributors to the problems of the disappearance of good jobs that we've been talking about. Um, so I don't think that's going to be the problem of the future because we're not looking forward into, there's no next China out there. Uh, China is increasingly turning I inwards in terms of its trade and so forth. Uh, but that, at least in the past, was one area where you could have said a bit, there's a bit of a tension. Um, uh, and of course, the, the movement of people directly uh, is brings that tension uh, even much more critically and directly. Um, of course, it couldn't happen, uh, um, you know, in a completely in an open mm. way. Yes. Uh, but there's a question of whether there is, as we will talk about later, I think, as you know, well ba balancing <laughs> mobility of capital and mobility. Well, I think money. it's just a, it's a question of the direction of globalization. So uh, we're can have a discussion of globalization later. And it's not a discussion about more or less globalization. It's a discussion about which globalization. And one of the characteristics of the established form of globalization is that it has tended to maximize the freedom of uh, money and things to cross national frontiers. But people have been arrested in the nation states or in blocks of relatively homogeneous nation states like the European Union. And you could say, well, no. People should gain freedom together with money and things in small cumulative steps. And that's a completely different kind of globalization. So when, uh, what, what's the topic in two weeks when we come back? What's our next, um, next class? It's not globalization yet, really. Anybody have their syllabus nearby? They should know this. Finance. Oh, finance. finance. Okay. Yes. Can everybody here in the back maybe you want to speak up? Yeah. Sure. Can you speak up? Yeah. Well, I mean, part of this is related to problems of climate change and, 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 and uh, sort of the new landscape with respect to green technology and so forth that, that we'll talk to again on in, in, I don't remember, maybe after finance, uh, we'll talk about, about those sorts of issues. Uh, but I, but I, I, don't see, I don't see any of these industries coming back uh, to the advanced countries. I, I think the technologies have fundamentally changed. Um, and it's and I think the imperative, at least in the advanced countries, of, of sort of 
you know, cleaning up, um, you know, manufacturing and so forth, decarbonization. You know, we can I we can discuss whether it's going rapidly enough, but I think you know the direction of change is, is again is quite clear. So the question there really becomes the the, the degree, the feasibility, and and the speed with which I think the developing countries will be able to primarily those that were hoping to build sort of you know uh, smokestack industries and things like that. You know what what does that do to their possibilities? And mm. I think given the attentions with the technological change that we've already talked about in some sense, you know, the, the, this climate change decarbonization challenge, the magnitude becomes somewhat less for developing countries because it's not as if, you know, these small sec industries present themselves as an opportunity for growth and development in any case. So it's not like the foregone opportunity cost of, you know, sort of moving to a greener path forward are, are significantly lower given technological trajectory in which they 